thanks for the uh, organizer to have me here on this platform. Uh, and uh, this, the title for my uh, short presentation was suggested by the conference organizer. So um, uh, among the three key words, I think I'll focus on the multilateralism a little bit more. Uh, the other two parts, I think the other uh, presenters uh, have focused on um, uh, in quite detail already. And uh, I also want to make it very clear that uh, there's probably no single Chinese perspective. Uh, what I present is as a scholar, uh, what I believe uh, my own way to read, understand, assess uh, predominantly the state perspective, uh, um, but not, um, not acting as a, a spokesperson for, for the state. Uh, now I'd like to start, start with this uh, recent episode uh, in international politics about a week ago. Um, when a uh, Chinese top leader met uh, his counterpart uh, in Moscow after their long uh, four and a half hour meeting, when they walk out uh, from the, the, the meeting hall, uh, Chinese President Xi Jinping uh, uh, talked to uh, uh, Vladimir Putin uh, and his first, uh, welfare words is, right now there are changes that uh, the like of which we have not uh, seen for hundred years and let's uh, drive these changes together. And Vladimir Putin res re responded, I agree. Yeah. So that's um, uh, interesting. And I think I catch an episode, little episode in um, the, the meeting between these uh, two uh, uh, politicians recently. And that, uh, that particular phrase of uh, changes we have not witnessed or we have not uh, experienced for 100 years is a concept or idea that uh, uh, President Xi has been uh, promoting uh, since 2000, 2018 and has been a policy narrative that has been picked up by um, um, researchers uh, within China, uh, become almost the, the, the defining uh, catchphrase to understand the basic large uh, structural change of the world. Right? Um, of course, 100 years is, uh, is not supposed to be a um, taken literally in, in this phrase. But we, if we do take it literally, that's back to uh, 19, 1917, 1918, around that period. Uh, so if that's the, that's the reference point of uh, changes, we haven't seen 100 years, and you can, you can uh, uh, make your own uh, judgment uh, what uh, this uh, kind of change um, he was probably referring to. Uh, and to some extent, I think this is similar to what uh, uh, Antonio Granchi uh, you, uh, famously used uh, the interregnum, uh, the oldest, uh, uh, the crisis he referred to um, uh, was the oldest dying and the newest um, cannot be born yet. Right? And then during this uh, interregnum period, a great a variety of uh, morbid symptoms appear. Uh, there's some similar, to me, there's some similarity uh, there. Um, if we think about in this context, uh, multilateralism in the con Chinese context, I think it might be helpful to think about how this word is taken. Uh, it's, uh, this is, of course, a word imported uh, from uh, outside, uh, uh, predominantly from the English context. Uh, uh, how it was uh, taken, how it was uh, perceived and used. And it might be helpful actually think about it as a contrasting concept, uh, contrast to a, a set of other concepts. Uh, and the one that's mostly often come up, come up most often in the Chinese context, the multilateralism of, obviously is set against unilateralism. But this unilateralism concept in the Chinese context is often used together with either protectionism or hegemon. Right? So in that sense, multilateralism is interpreted as some sort of institutions or mechanism that's not in uh, alignment with protectionism and in particularly not in alignment with Hajima. I think this is a theme uh, a few of the uh, previous speakers on our uh, seminar today already mentioned. Uh, uh, this uh, multilateral is supposed to be an anti-hegemon, anti mostly as a anti-hegemon concept, anti-hegemon uh, institutions or mechanism. Uh, that's the first layer of connotation. Uh, the second layer of connotation that's uh, very often used or covered in the Chinese context is the subtle difference between multilateralism and the multipolarity, uh, uh, multipolarity, uh, uh, multipolarity, or multipolarism. Uh, I think multipolarity maybe. Yeah. 
uh, sounds more natural. Um, up until now, I think multilateral is still the word that's um, uh, somewhat preferable. I use much more often than multipolarity. Uh, an interesting case to, to compare is the Russian policy narrative. Uh, uh, overall, the Russian uh, uh, policy or strategic circles and the official documents use multipolarity much more often, uh, much more in, uh, in a more, much more intensified way. I think in the Chinese context, multipolarity is uh, holds a, a slightly too strong emphasis on the poor. And uh, for various reasons in the Chinese context, multilateralism still is more preferable because it doesn't indicate such a strong sense of uh, the world is consisting of uh, several, several poles and each pole has a certain um, so it's a sphere, sphere of influence uh, doesn't have that much stronger of a connotation. And the third layer of uh, connotation for multilateralism is uh, multilateralism indicates some sort of, a, of a, a, the willingness or possibility of a socialization um, as against uh, isolation or uh, rejection of being socialized, uh, rejection of being socialized. Um, uh, in that sense, multilateralism, in that particular sense, um, uh, was particularly relevant for China back in the, for example, 1980s, uh, when uh, it's uh, supposed to be isolated from the world, uh, predominantly from the West. It went open, supposedly open up. Uh, multilateralism holds a particularly important role as a sign of uh, a willingness to be um, socialized. Uh, and the last layer is multilateralism as uh, institutions or rule binding behavior uh, as against uh, non-institutionalized uh, behavior. Um, so uh, this is what I see uh, the different layer of connotation multilateralism that have particular relevance in the Chinese context. Uh, and then uh, very quickly um, over time, the sort of China's attitude towards multilateralism over time. Uh, um, if we start with the early eighties all the way to a particular recent recent, uh, and the, the pattern is uh, relatively clear from uh, avoidance, uh, avoidance of contact with uh, multilateralism to a somewhat conservative or reactive uh, attitude, and then uh, rea re reactive embracing uh, to recently more active shaping. Uh, from the 80s, uh, from relatively isolated, isolated predominantly from West, uh, uh, it's a, a kind of type uh, attitude of watch, learn, wait, uh, uh, all through the 80s. Uh, and then uh, from the mid 1990s, uh, increasingly enthusiastic uh, uh, to join various in international in organizations uh, with a, a very high participation rate. Uh, and uh, late 1990s, uh, probably uh, up until early, early 2000, is a era of deep engagement in international institutions. Uh, from the mid 2000s, uh, there appeared, appeared to be um, uh, intensified efforts uh, to build the so-called parallel institutions. And then more recently, um, we see a much more active uh, a stance, uh, and not only openly proposing uh, policies, agendas, reforms uh, uh, of existing uh, institutions, but occasionally also show intention and uh, efforts to to, to uh, utilize or even maneuver these regimes in new directions. Um, and and uh, look at the different policy arenas, you can, uh, I think we can also see several different approaches uh, uh, in relation to uh, inter especially in existing international institutions uh, through this multilateralism framework. Uh, there's a this learn, integrate, adapt. Uh, there's this uh, reform from within. Uh, uh, this creates something new to fill, fill in the missing gap or to cover the residual of uh, international institutions. And the, the, the last one, uh, uh, you might call it a rock the boat. Uh, uh, the, supposedly, uh, relative to status quo, this is probably the more radical one. Uh, uh, but uh, there is a, a obviously a, 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 a uh, more issue by issue or maybe uh, policy arena by policy arena uh, different approaches to existing institutions. Uh, and this is uh, some examples, uh, what I refer to uh, from the mid of 2000, uh, some clear efforts to, to build, uh, propose, initiate, build, uh, 
or strengthen uh, one might see uh, as a parallel institutions. Uh, uh, this is a this is a, 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 uh, not not a comprehensive list. Uh, I have something uh, along that line with a much longer list. Uh, that the gist of that the parallel institutions is uh, create initiate or create new institutions or mechanism that are not supposed to be complete completely in competition with existing institutions, but meant to somewhat fill in the missing uh, sort of uh, missing gaps in uh, provision of public goods and to supposedly route around existing institutions. Um, so those efforts are uh, mostly in economic, economic institutions, but you can see similar efforts in some other type of uh, regional uh, bilateral, multilateral, regional, or sometimes even uh, international, global, uh, global. Um, here, of course, uh, several um, presenters already mentioned that how do you assess the increasingly, particularly economically influential uh, China's intention and behavior uh, in relation to the existing international system? And uh, so the concept of revisionism comes up very often. Um, uh, here, I bar uh, I borrow one uh, interpretation from uh, a British scholar, Richard Sakwa. He proposed this concept to uh, describe Russia's behavior at least uh, decades ago. But I think it actually uh, fits China's uh, behavior or Chinese state's behavior much better um, recently. Uh, so the, what, what uh, Professor Sakwa's interpretation of uh, so-called new revisionist powers is they're not satisfied with the, Predominantly, they're not satisfied with the hegemonic nature of the current international system, right? Uh, but they actually generally support and abide by the funding principle, or to use the concept from the uh, uh, English school uh, in international relations theory, uh, the so-called primary institution of the uh, current international society. And they do not actually directly change uh, the, the uh, liberal internationalism. Right? They constantly question the practice, but not the funding principle of international societies. And they criticize other actors, in particularly uh, the US or supposedly the hegemon of the current international system, mostly for deviating from these uh, principles. I think that's what, uh, what Professor, was, Professor Sakwa's uh, interpretation, the new revision. I think in most cases it applies to China's behavior very well. And uh, those, uh, revisionism very often highlights or even even uh, brings to the forefront some of the inherent contradiction uh, contained in the so-called liberal international order, predominantly constructed under American hege uh, hegemonies in the post World War II and sometimes in the post Cold War uh, period. Um, and um, the, the result sometimes is contradictory uh, because um, the, the the result may come up with uh, some intended consequence. Uh, anti systemic consequences. It, uh, these uh, new revisionist power may not intend to do so, but their counter-hegemonic behavior actually may lead unintentionally lead to a systemic stalemate deadlock. And that's what we see in a lot of the policy arenas, what uh, the, the global system or system uh, on a larger international level cannot move. Right? It gets stuck in a sub suboptimal results that uh, most international actors don't feel satisfied with. And uh, one example, again, this is built on some other, other scholars work, is the World WTO's uh, free trade global negotiation. The latest round of uh, uh, Doha round uh, was increasing participation of uh, rising powers, uh, uh, India, Brazil, China to a slightly less extent, uh, has a very strong um, anti-hegemonic um, uh, power in the previous rounds of uh, free trade and negotiation. I think there's a legitimacy to that. But the, the intended consequence is on a global level, a free trade and negotiation has been uh, 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 in a deadlock uh, since then. Uh, and the Doha round that didn't move anywhere. Uh, um, and if I still have time, and I will wrap up with uh, two, or three, uh, two or three slides of what I see very recent, uh, recent by uh, less than 10 years. Uh, some of the recent trends in within the Chinese mostly uh, official narrative concepts about uh, uh, multilateralism. Uh, um, multilateralism uh, for the very recent period uh, in official narrative increasingly is being used or referred to alongside with uh, 
global governance, uh, which this is actually a very recent, very recent phenomenon. Um, the secondly, multilateralism is being incorporated and uh, used alongside with uh, 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 the, the, the uh, probably uh, catch-all phrase, uh, catch-all um, uh, policy uh, guideline uh, proposed by the current uh, leadership, a uh, community with a shared future for mankind, which is, of course, a very loose, loose, uh, loose concept. Uh, to some extent, uh, this is, uh, to me, as uh, uh, rhetorically or as a concept, actually it has a, a, a very high level um, cosmopolitan connotation a on the conceptual level. Um, but multilateralism is being incorporated into that. Uh, meanwhile, there's in, uh, intensified a critique of so-called fake multilateralism. Uh, fake multilateralism is associated with a set of different things. Uh, US hegemony, that's something I already highlighted, uh, inequality among big states and the small states, the practice of a block forming alliance, some so-called Cold War style, small circle confrontation, Cold War, Cold War mentality, and also different violation of UN Charter international laws. And uh, uh, fake multilateralism is predominantly described as acts that undermine, indeed undermine international order and create confrontation division on the banner of so-called rule. Here, I want to uh, make one particular uh, uh, big point, uh, which is in the Chinese context, uh, both for uh, official policy narrative circle, but also generally as, uh, as, a, as a consensus within the scholarly community, uh, there's a very strong consensus to, uh, to criticize the legitimacy of the concept of liberal international order. Uh, and this is a concept that some, some of our previous um, speakers used. Uh, um, uh, I think uh, I might not have time to go into detail, but generally speaking, uh, th it's that in the Chinese context, that there, um, most people don't think there was a liberal international order to start with. Um, neither liberal nor international enough, nor order, uh, no, no clear order. Uh, and uh, gen supposedly genuine multilateralism is still a stick with uh, to stick with UN and international law at the foundation. Uh, then uh, there are some other. Uh, possible new addition to that, uh, Silk Road Sprit, and I think our next speaker will probably touch on that. Um, uh, uh, another set of uh, uh, ideational, uh, ideational concepts are supposed to, uh, to, to supplement, uh, supplement the UN law and the international, U international uh, UN system and international. national. And ultimately, <coughs> excuse me, um, these whole narratives try to uphold China as the leader of genuine, genuine uh, multilateralism, uh, uh, support openness, inclusiveness, and a mutual uh, benefit, uh, and even as a protector uh, or uh, protector of, uh, of free trade uh, global, uh, globalization in a almost in a liberal, liberal, um, uh, a liberal uh, liberalism in the economic sense. Uh, and one last point, I did, also in the past few years, uh, you can see a very clear in, uh, efforts to more intensify its use of um, discursive power to shape common values. Uh, uh, that kind of work has been very active recently. I proposed concepts like a whole uh, uh, process, democracy, total se security, uh, and the, all these values are supposed to be defined by genuine international, international democracy. Again, not monop monopolized by certain country or certain uh, small group of country. Uh, and also I see a very clear trend, that kind of uh, summation um, uh, of uh, China's domestic practice will be elevated as indigenous knowledge of China, but will be elevated and presented to the outside world and may be inject injected into multilateralism for supposedly new, new world or in, in, in the future. And also, that there's uh, some efforts uh, to use these new concepts and uh, uh, institutions to potentially not only being socialized by others, as we see in the 80s, uh, early 1990s, uh, that's part of the multilateralism indicated, as I mentioned, right? But now uh, as a way to potentially socialize others. Right? So yeah, that's all I want, I want to share. Thank you for listening. Thank you.